Hello, and welcome to Magic is Real, a podcast focused on the fascinating world of near-death experiences, spirit communication, and all things metaphysical and spiritual. The mission of this project is to share messages of hope and inspiration with others, and to spread the word that death is only an illusion. Thank you for being here with an open heart and mind. I wish you peace, light, and love always. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Magic is Real. I'm Shannon. I'm your host. Today, I have with me the lovely Annette Marnaccio. I told her I was going to need to look at it. Um, so Annette is here because she is the author of Your Soul Focus, which is a story of her own awakening, um, I would say, but I'm going to have her sort of run it down how she likes to describe it because I don't like to put words in your mouth. But Annette is here because she had what I'm going to call a trans, uh, spiritually transformative experience. Um, you can put your own words to it, but uh, it that happened after her mother-in-law passed and began to show signs that she is still here, very much here with us. So Annette, welcome and thank you so much for being here, first of all. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to be here. Me too. Now, we're going to talk about your book and the in, some of the insights without giving too much away because I want people to read the book. Uh, but I also would love to start with just sort of knowing a little bit. I know you're a CPA, a healthcare executive, very average, normal person, um, not into the woo-woo, as people would say. Um, and how did you grow up? What was your um, sort of background when it came to religious attitudes, spiritual perspectives, and that sort of thing? So um, you're absolutely right. I'm a, I'm a CPA and a healthcare executive. So I'm really like entrenched in the kind of 2D slash 3D numbers world and not a typically spiritual or, or religious kind of world. Um, having said that, I grew up as Catholic in an Italian family and um, we attended church all the time and I in enjoyed and enjoy church, you know, sort of uh, sitting in that sort of solemn and solitude kind of situation and just reflective, you know, the attributes that sort of go along with um, church going. Uh, but we never really spoke about uh, the afterlife other than um, Jesus rising from the dead. <laughs> I don't think I thought I could rise from the dead or, or that other people could rise from the dead. So I never really focus too much on it. I was really intent growing up on being uh, successful. And to me, since I loved numbers and math, I still love numbers and math. I really spent a lot of my time um, doing schoolwork and being, you know, accelerating in math and um, spending time with family and friends. So I didn't really focus on anything that you would think would be traditionally spiritual or metaphysical. I, it's not that I was skeptical. I just never really focused on it. Or right. thought. Makes total sense. There are people like you that are math minded. I'm not one of those people at <laughs> all. So I, I have so much respect for that. So when did this all change for you? What was your life looking like at the time when so, your mother-in-law became ill? Yeah. So what happened was, you know, uh, I was living a, a normal, you know, I, you know, I'd say great life. I had a very nice family. I had two uh, young children, you know, 11 and 12 at the time or 10 and 11 at the time. And I was working more than full time, which I still work. I, you know, I love, I love working. So that's a little interesting, but I, I love my job. So I've, um, so I was working and very busy. And what happened is my mother-in-law uh, was diagnosed with stage four pancreatic cancer in October of 2005. And a week later, my mother was diagnosed with breast cancer, uh, stage two breast cancer. So my family was thrown into this um, unbelievable world of learning about chemotherapy, radi uh, radiation therapy, surgeries, stage four, stage two, pancreatic, you know, novel treatments, immunotherapies. So we were just for a year scrambling to doctors, doing everything we could to keep 
um, our families above water because we're still trying to work full time and we have the kids and school and stuff. And then we had both sides of, of the family, you know, really gravely ill. And um, we, I come from a very small family, like my, um, it was my husband's family lives very local to us and my family lives very local to us. So like I'm, I was two miles from my parents and five miles from his parents. And um, even though my background is CPA, I've for the most part of my career been in healthcare. So I'm a CPA in industry. So there was a lot, I have a lot of connections. So there was a lot of me, you know, reaching out, trying to understand now the clinical end of things so that I could make sure that my mother and mother-in-law mother had the best of care for that year. Um, it, it really turned out to be a year out of my mother's life. Um, she came out the other side, but she went through surgery, very aggressive chemo, radiation, uh, radi yeah, radiation therapy. And she ended up living for um, another 15 years. She died April of 20, 2022. She just died um, of, of, of cancer, but not the breast cancer. Whereas my mother-in-law, during that same year, going through all those kinds of treatments and stuff, pancreatic is so brutal. She ended up uh, dying October of 2006 from the pancreatic cancer. So that's where I was in my life when my mother-in-law passed. Yeah, it sounds like a very uh, normal life affected by the tragedy of illness and and pain and that sort of thing, and then death ultimately. So let's go to that first message or whatever, wherever you want to start, really. Yeah, sure. your, it's your story. It's the pom-pom story. Yep. So then that's what it is. So um, after my, my, after we buried my mother-in-law, that following, we buried her on a Saturday, October of 2006, that following Wednesday, my daughter, who was 13 at the time, um, she's having, we're having breakfast at the, at the table and she's ready to go to school and I'm going to go to work. And, um, you know, the weekend was very rough because we were a close, small family, but anyway, so my daughter says to me in a very, very matter of fact way, guess what? I got a gift from grandma Lucille. My mother-in-law's name was Lucille from grandma Lucille yesterday. And I'm thinking, hmm, <laughs> well, that's not possible. So, but, but she's 13 and she was very close to my mother-in-law. So I'm assuming it's some kind of coping mechanism, grief thing going on here. And so um, I said, really, what kind of gift? And then she proceeded to tell me what I refer to um, in my book as the pom-pom story, uh, that she was basically uh, making 3D cards in art class, class the day before. And, um, she decided to make uh, a 3D card with green and red pom-poms. And so she decided to put 11, I don't know why 11, but 11 green and 11 red pom-poms on her card. Cards. So she went to the art closet, took out the Tupperware of pom-poms, all different colors and sizes. And she picked out her 11 red and her 11 green and she recounted them. She was very, very meticulous, which she still is as an adult, but very meticulous. And then she brought the, the Tupperware back to the art closet and she came back and she said, there were my 11 green and my 11 red and one um, lavender and one ivory the exact same colors as the balloons we let go at grandma's gravesite that previous weekend. And I was like, again, thinking, okay, this is impossible, but my mind is racing. Like, I don't even know how to process this or how to interact with her because she must be like hallucinating this. And, um, she, and then she says, do you want to see them? And I'm thinking, oh my goodness, she's going to produce them. <laughs> so <laughs> I said, yes. And she runs upstairs and she runs downstairs and she's got two pom-poms in her hands, the exact same colors and not even like purple and white. I mean, they were lavender and cream, like the exact colors of those balloons we let go of the gravesite. And I didn't even know what to say. So um, I said, well, all I can say is this, if these really did, if these really did come from Grandma Lucille, then you should be buried that with them when you die in your, in your coffin because that would be an absolute miracle. And she was excited and proud and she ran back up and she put them away and 
she went to school and I went to work and I didn't know what to make of it. I was like, this is, she's got obviously going through something and I probably need some grief specialist to help us through this. Um, and I don't, you know, I asked her how the pom-poms appeared there or whatever. And I said, did somebody else put them there? Did they drop on the floor? And I could see her mind was racing. Like she had every idea under the sun and she had played it through. She's like, I know, I wish I had saw, maybe they floated through the air or maybe they just appeared there. I don't know. So she was really trying to grapple with it herself. So she seemed very genuinely surprised, but I was thinking, I don't know, you know, this can't Kids. be kids and their imaginations <laughs> right you know and yeah. how can you speak so but what I did to try and help me make sense of it was um what a lot of people do I think I, I was talking to a lot of people about it so I was telling friends uh family co-workers the pom-pom story trying to see if people would be like oh you know something so-and-so went through this and you have to go to some grief specialist or some kind of psychologist or whatever and instead what I, what I was finding was person after person like has their own stories and or, and believes in the afterlife and they were like oh yeah you know when my father died he flickered the lights and and there's this cardinal out in the backyard when my grandmother died and and, and I'm just like my mind was spinning because it's just not a topic of conversation that people speak about yet many people not all but many people have really concrete stories so at one point I was telling my friend I'm still friends with her and we had been friends for about 10 years eight years maybe at that point and we just had never discussed the afterlife before and I'm telling her the pom-pom story and she said um after I finished the whole thing she said well you believe in the afterlife don't you Annette like she was shocked that I didn't believe it which which is actually the subtitle the of, my of book. your book because I wanted to name it that but it seemed a little too long but that was the the line that really started opening my eyes because now I had a credible friend who was very matter of fact about like, of course the pom-poms came from your mother-in-law. So now I'm, now I was drifting from these, you know, being a hallucination to, could this really be possible? I mean, really, you, you think it's possible? So um, she was like, absolutely. And then she, told me, and I, I find this in all of life, that um, you, you sometimes you, um, you are left breadcrumbs and you follow the breadcrumbs and then all of a sudden something happens or your eyes are opened. And so that's what happened with me. So it was like this led to this. So it wasn't anything like boom, but it was this and led to this. Or, yes. So she says to me, my girlfriend, Maria, who I named Donna in the book because I changed names. Um, she said to me, um, yeah, when my father died, I actually frequent a medium here on Long Island, which is where I live, Josephine G. And she helps me tap into my deceased father every once in a while. And I get information from him. And I was like, you're kidding. <laughs> you know? And she said, no, I've done it probably about three or four times. I, I wanted his blessing on my son's name. I wanted to understand when we should move my mother out of her home, my widowed mother. So I tap into my father and he communicates through this medium. And I was like, my mind was blown. I mean, I went to work that day, my head was racing. It was about a week or so after, or two weeks after the pom-pom situation with my daughter. But now I have a very credible friend who is very matter of fact about the afterlife. And, and a lot of people at work have stories. So now I'm thinking, this is unbelievable. That following weekend, so now I was sort of like in early December at that point um, of 2006, I went to dinner with my um, husband, son, and recently widowed father-in-law in, on Main Street, just in my town. And we went out to dinner on Saturday night. We were seated by a large window and there was a poster in the window and it was facing the street, but we could see through the poster. And it said, um, dinner and medium show with Josephine G, the exact medium that my girlfriend had mentioned, because, you know, that's how the universe works. Now yes, I understand it is. that. <laughs> yeah. Synchronicities. Yeah, that was, you know, I, I didn't understand at the time, but now I understand You're it. Like, what a coincidence. Well, I'm like, it's unbelievable. So I went home that day. It was going to be April of 2007, so like four months away. 
So I went home to my girlfriend. I'm like, do you want to go? And she's like, oh my God, I can't believe she's going to be here in town. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Okay, fine. So um, we have a third girlfriend that came with us too. But between in that four month period, I'm telling more and more people a pom-pom story and I'm hearing more and more stories of, of, from professional people I work with even who have stories of their deceased loved ones and little tidbit things. And I was like, I can't believe like, this is like this underground. Yeah, totally. <laughs> Nobody talks about, it just doesn't come up. Yeah. And everybody percolates with their little stories. I was like, hmm, so interesting. So I, um, I made reservations and at party of three and we went to the uh, dinner. It was the last Saturday in April of 2007, so April 27th, 29th, whatever it was. And so we were seated in there and we have our dinner. And then this woman comes out, Josephine G, and she's got her microphone, like a regular medium a gallery reading in a, you know, in a, in a restaurant or something or in a room. And, um, and I'm thinking, I'm thinking of it like a magic show. Yeah. Like it's going to be like a magic show. And she proceeds to read some people over there and they have a deceased police officer or firefighter and all the tables crying and whatnot. And I'm like, oh, they must know her and they're planted or whatever, yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. But the second reading was she comes right over to our table and she says, um, I'm here with um, a woman named Lucille, my mother-in-law's name. And I was like, and my girlfriend's glaring at me like, hey, take the microphone. And I'm like, I'm not taking that microphone. Like, who, who, like, what? Who told her? Like, what? Yeah. Like, what? <laughs> so she's continuing, though, um, which to me, after I understood more about mediums, when people say, oh, maybe, maybe they're um, not true or they're fake or whatever, it's like in front of 150 people, why would she continue down the road? I know. <laughs> when, it, you know, I'm not taking the bait. No mm -hmm. one's taking the bait. Why would she keep pushing? You know, like she wants to, you know, make a fool of herself. No, right. But, you know, she really had a message, but I didn't realize at the time. I was just like, okay, somebody told her my mother's name. So then she said, okay, if it's not Lucille, something like Lou, something with an L. And I'm not taking the microphone. My girlfriend's glaring at me, and I'm not taking the microphone. So she um, ends up. The woman behind me at the booth, booth or table behind me raises her hand and says, my name's Elizabeth, like there's an L in it. So she gives the microphone to Elizabeth and um, my girlfriend's kicking me under the table, really upset. And, and she says to and Josephine, the medium says to Elizabeth, oh, I see you're going to Italy in a couple of months. I had just booked Italy for a couple of months. So now my mother was uh -huh. getting gets information from obviously not for Elizabeth. Elizabeth's like, well, I just came back from Florida. <laughs> you, know, <laughs> you know, So yeah. um, she retreats from Elizabeth and she goes read somebody else. And this is pivotal because this is where my mother-in-law was not going to give up. She came back. Yeah. She came back. She said, this woman is still here. So this is my mother-in-law, her gumption opening my eyes now. This woman's still here. If it's not Lucille, it's something with an L. She's holding her stomach like she died of uh, stomach cancer or something like stomach cancer. My mother-in-law had died of pancreatic cancer. So now I took the, I said, all right, I'll take this. And so I took the microphone and then I had what you would see as a very evidential reading. Um, and then she said the one line, sort of like you believe in the afterlife, don't you? The one line that took my meter like from here to here. And I was like, all right, I got to figure this out. Yeah. And that line was, how, how is Rita? I see she's still here, isn't she? Now, Rita was my mother's name. So every, now they were both sick at the same time. Every time we'd visit my mother-in-law, she would say, how's Rita doing? Every time we'd visit my mother, she'd say, how's Lucille doing? And we were always, well, not that good, not that good, not that good. But when now I'm standing here with this total stranger and she says, how's Rita? Now, Lucille and Rita are not terribly common names to begin with, but yeah. so she pegged both names. But when she said that line, how's Rita doing? She's still here, isn't she? I know my mother-in-law knew that yeah. would be the thing she would say how's Rita doing? That would be the thing she would say. And that was it. That my, from that point on, I was obsessed. I was like, I need to understand what is going on. In my typical accounting brain, it was like, I need to figure this out. And I spent four years researching everything metaphysical, 
everything I could get my hands on, going to all kinds of classes, meditating, doing anything spiritual, going to group events. I wasn't in deep grief. Of course, I love my mother-in-law and I missed her, but I wasn't in deep, deep grief. So the people, like people sometimes say, well, you figure it out when you're clouded by grief. I didn't like have a near-death experience. I didn't hit rock bottom. And I was just a regular person <laughs> saying, what? Yeah. <laughs> Oh, yeah. Wait, what? <laughs> That's how it happened for me too. So I get that. <laughs> you know, yeah. I have to, I have to understand this. I need to understand this. And so that's what I did. I spent four years just entrenched that. So that was, let's say 2007 to 11, maybe in, entrenched in everything metaphysical so that I could get my head around it. Right. And, uh, did you yourself take mediumship classes? I'm just wondering. I did. I have to say, I know that um, a, a lot of people, and, and I know you, if you have that right brain going and you have that propensity, um, er, people with that gift um, say anybody can do it. A you know, anybody can do it. And I took a lot of mediumship classes and I meditated for a year and a half, same time of day, every day, I can get myself to zero in meditation without the very easily. And I never, never got anything from the other side, nothing. So, I mean, I am very left brain dominant, yeah. very left brain dominant. And um, I think to have that gift, you have to have a little bit stronger right brain going. Yeah. Um, so I know everyone says, you know, everybody can do it. But uh, what I think, what I really think is it's like musical talent. And if you, I don't have musical talent either. If you gave me a great guitar and wonderful lessons with a wonderful teacher, yeah. I might be able to croak out some really bad song that you can listen to. But if you give somebody who's got that innate talent, the same guitar, and the same lessons or half as many lessons, they they would play you a ballad that you would make you weep because everyone's got different skill sets and different brain function. And I just, I could not, I could meditate. I could do all, I just never even saw any glimpse of anything, never heard anything. Now I have dream downloads and I get, mm -hmm. I have dream, you know, my spirit guides have visited me, um, but I, it's, I don't, I just don't have that. That's just not my gift. I know that the universe is using me in different ways. Yeah, Actually, absolutely. In ways for sure. But I just, that's not, <laughs> but I guess yeah. I a lot of them. I was going to tell you, say that, uh, respond to that because that's, that's, I'm a medium and that's how I learned is I took classes because of similar things with a similar story, just not with the, the death involved, but it was a, another type of a loss I went through in grief and I actually did learn to do it however there is we always say that I was going to say the same thing the musical anyone can learn to play piano but not everyone will be Chopin right. I'm a good medium but I still am no Teresa Caputo because I wasn't born seeing spirit hearing spirit she says in her book that she wasn't either she's like do you think I, she's like, I didn't, wasn't born like this. She's like, I, I took classes. I didn't think I was ready. She said, my mentor was like, you're ready to go. I was like, no, I'm not. So, mm -hmm. but you're right. I think anyone can learn to do it. And you, you're just going to be more, as you said, it does have to do a lot with brain waves. That's yeah. where meditation comes in, getting yourself into a theta state. And they've done brain scans on mediums and shown that their brains work differently mm -hmm. while they're reading they go into a meditative state faster than other people can. I'm right. very logical myself. Mm -hmm. And yet I'm a huge empath and feeler. So right. I, my head does get in the way a lot of the time, but I, I think that's important for people to know. So I'm glad you brought that up that mm -hmm. anyone can learn it and you can get information. Mm -hmm. Will you be reading for people? Not, you may not want to, mm -hmm. um, but will you, everybody be able to read other people? No. And I mean, you know, I have a good client base, but I'm even really hard on myself. They're yeah. all happy. And I'm going, no, I, sh I could have been better. I should have been like, I want to be like Matt Fraser. So it's all just different uh, levels, I guess you'd say, of how adv how um, advanced we are and how our brains actually work and what wavelength it is your brain goes into because it's picking up on a different radio station, essentially. 
Yeah, you know, it's interesting. I was at, um, I was a guest speaker because of my book at um, a psychic conference um, last year. And as I was speaking, there was this young girl in the front row and she had, um, she was very like goth looking, like she had the purple hair and a hoodie on and she was very young. And, um, and I was telling everybody my story and people do ask, oh, are you a medium or you know, did you develop that? And I said exactly what I just said here. And she said, uh, um, you, you may not be a medium, but the universe is activating you in the exact same way that, she, that it's activating a medium as a conduit. And I was like, it took me back because wow. I was like, you know something, you're absolutely right. It's like when the student becomes a teacher, she taught me something because I was like, she's absolutely right. It's like, I was really during that four years, I was so intent on, I've got, if, if everybody can do this, I've got to be able to do it. I want mm -hmm. to do it so much. I dedicated the time to it. I dedicated the resources to it. I've got to be able to do it. And I, I wasn't able to do it. And mm. so I was very discouraged and, but I, I, it, it is what it is. And then four years later, um, what I found during the next four years is that the universe kept putting me in the path of people who needed a piece of what I had learned. And at the end of that four years, I, during that four years, the next set of four years, people were like, oh my goodness, you changed my life. That was great. That, you know, all those things I'd learned. And I was like, you know, for an accountant, it's not like I'm a doctor or a nurse and I'm used to like changing people's lives, you know? So people telling me, oh my goodness, it was life-changing. It was like great feedback. So yeah. at, the, at the end of that four years, by 2018-ish, I think, uh, 17, 18, I was like, I have to put this in a book. And I think that was my, that's what I was supposed to have done. You know, uh, yeah, your so path. Everybody's, everybody's different. Like after I published the book, my girlfriend, another girlfriend said to me, um, your mother-in-law must have been such a strong woman. And I was like, she was strong, but she wasn't like super strong, much more strong than anybody else, I don't think. And she said, the two of you must have been so close. And I was like, we, we were close, but we were a family. And, you know, I don't think we were that much closer than it. And she was like, well, then why did she come through to you? And I was like, I don't know. And then she thought about it a little bit. And probably about a half hour later, she said, I figured it out. because She knew you'd write a book. And I was like, oh, you know something? That makes sense to me. Mm -hmm. I think the universe made her and she, uh, you know, had to get me to do this so that I could summarize it into a book. And if it helps one person, great. If it helps a thousand people, great. But um, I think that was the, that was what I was supposed to do. I wasn't supposed to be a medium. I'm not, you know, it's just not my thing. I have a different skill set. My skill set at work is that I can, I, I run a, a physician contracting and compensation department with a lot of um, technical, legal nuances, regulations, and um, fair market value assessments. So I am able to take very elusive topics and skinny them down so that people can understand them. And that's what I did with this book. <laughs> so I was like, Genius. you know, it's my skill set. That's my skill set. And so that's, that's really just, you know, what, what I was supposed to have done with it. And I did. And about three, two weeks, maybe only, maybe three, but maybe two weeks after I wrote the book. And, you know, the power of social media is just like unbelievable. Yeah. So this woman from, see, I'm in New York, from Seattle, the other side of the country, reaches out to me and said, I just um, got bought your book on Amazon and read it. My 23-year-old son, this was a year ago, died two years earlier, and I've been struggling with it. And your book had... Um, perspectives in it that I had never considered before. And I wanted to thank you for writing it because it really helped me with my, my grief. And I was like, oh, I'm done. <laughs> <You know? laughs> like, That's right. Okay. Like this whole thing could have been for that one woman, you know? And, Absolutely. And, you know, and, and now it's helped hundreds of others too, but even that one was like, that. you know, okay, <laughs> you know? Right. So, and yeah. I love that your book, your story, and I want to talk about the book, uh, but I love to 
that it comes from a place of logic. And that's what I try to do here on the podcast. I like to have very grounded, authentic, believable people, reasonable people, not to convince anybody, but because it helps it to be more digestible and accessible. If you are on the fence and you are agnostic, as I was too, I was mainly agnostic. Uh, I think it just helps to say, okay, well, let me listen to this, what this woman has to say. She seems very logical and very smart and not out there. Right. Um, and some of the stuff we talk about is a little out there for some, mm -hmm. but I like to, I like to incorporate all of it, but I'd love to talk about your book. And obviously, as I said, we want people to read the book, but tell me a, sort of some key points about what it is that you have learned in these four years of research that you immersed yourself in and also just the, prog the progressive relationship that you've had with other loved ones in spirit and, or your mother-in-law since being more aware of their presence and, and messages and signs? Mm. Well, that's a great and a big, big question. Yeah, start so wherever I, you want to. I don't, I don't mind sharing anything in the book. I, I was very uh, fortunate to be interviewed very early on when I first published it by a wonderful woman, Sandra Champlain. And she said to me right from the beginning, like right before we went on air, she said, don't worry about sharing anything in your book because when you share anything, yeah. That's what, sort of, first of all, that's what elevates the vibration of the universe. So that's what everybody yeah. really wants in the end, more than, you know, worrying about a book sale. Um, but also it, it, it piques people's interest. Yeah. So I, I share anything in the book and if people buy the book, great. And if they don't buy the book, that's fine too. So um, I'm not worried about sharing that. But um, the first, the, the, um, the biggest thing <laughs> that I learned right off the bat, after I understood that life goes on, which took me quite some time because I was like, what? Um, I needed to understand then if life goes on, what is this about? What are we doing here? What, why bother with this? How does this differ from the other side? So that was my main question. My main question wasn't so much about all the levels on the other side and all the soul groups, on, which all I wish I learned, all the soul groups on the other side. It was really trying to understand how does this pertain to me right now, to all of us? And so that's what I really wanted to understand. So the biggest thing I learned is that what we're going through here is a teeny tiny sliver, sliver of our soul's existence. And we are intentionally by design born with these kind of dunce caps on, blinders to some extent, so that we can't really see or we have the same perspective that we would have when we're on the other side. Be because when we come here, we come here with a specific purpose or a series of little purposes. And the purpose may be for us, maybe a big grand purpose, or it might even be a purpose for someone else that has nothing to do with us. Like my purpose here, whole purpose here could have been for that one woman in Seattle. I may have made a decision on the other side to come here for that one person. And, and, or it could be a larger purpose for a lot of people. It could be a grand purpose, like a big movie star has, you know, um, the ability to impact lots of people, or it could be something that's just for yourself or for your son or for your father, um, or for one person that you knew in some past life, that's part of your soul group that you don't even know that much right now. So, uh, but you come here with a purpose. And if you did not have those blinders on and you knew more about where your life was going and where your loved one's life was going, you would really be distracted yeah. <laughs> from really um, achieving your purpose. So for instance, if you sort of knew that when you came here, you were going to die at 55 years old in a yeah. car crash, you would never, like from 54 years old, you wouldn't be, you'd be a hermit. You wouldn't even leave your house. Right. You know? So I know that everybody like struggles wanting to know more and, you know, what else is life about? But, um, but at the, at the end of the day, you do have to sort of trust that as long as you're living your daily life in um, kindness and gratitude uh, and sharing with people um, that you're moving toward your purpose. And, and you wouldn't want to know everything. If you knew that your you know, mother was going to die of a heart attack at 80 years old, you, you would live your life so differently. Yeah. 
You know, like for, for the five years prior to that, she'd be eating chicken and rice and nothing else. And well, who knows what? So you, you don't really, it's not, it's not appropriate for us to know everything here. You know, we really just come here with what we need to do to achieve our purpose because it's not about here. It's about the other side. It's not about here. Here is very important, but this is a sliver of our growth. And it's really more important that we do what we need to do here so that when we go back, we can say we've done what we, we needed to do. The whole life review thing and judgment day, which are sort of taught in, taught in religion, um, the real um, entity that passes judgment on you is yourself. You go back there and your soul will determine if you did your purpose or you, you, you accomplished your purpose or not, and what level of light is appropriate for you to reside in on the other side, based on where you are in, in, your, in your life. So, um, so that the whole, your whole perspective has to do with, uh, to me, Einstein's theory of relativity. You can only relate to what you can relate to. And so we intentionally can only relate to this world. And what happens in the day to day is we really start thinking how big it is and how big we are and how important it is. And we are very entrenched in our egos and egos ha ego has a very negative connotation, but it really isn't. It's just all we can relate to. We can't help ourselves. It's part of being human. So ego is not a negative thing. It's just a, it's a bit of a limiting thing. And it's supposed to be that way. So we think of things as bigger and deeper here than we do on the other side. The other side is a little bit less, um, I'll say intense mm -hmm. uh, than, than it is here. So a lot of the reason we come here is to fast track our soul's growth. It's to, it's to stretch our soul because you, you grow on the other side too but it's a very positive environment on the other side. So there's a, the way you grow there is a lot of uh, meditating and prayers and doing good for people and kindness. Whereas here you have a lot of grief and a lot of burdens and you, the feelings are very intense. So, uh, and the negative feelings are very intense. So there's more of ability to stretch your soul here than there is on the other side. So we're here sort of to fast track our soul's growth to some extent. So I that, love that. Yeah, that's sort of like the big thing of what I I learned. Um, but there's a lot of things that what I, after I wrote the book, I went through it and I said, how many points are there, perspectives or examples that people could walk away with and apply to their everyday life? And I think there were 20, about 27. So there's 27 different concepts. And as you said, when you, four years being everything in everything metaphysical, I read a lot of things that I was like, what? I mean, there's stuff out there that's, it, once you start looking at it, yeah, there's a lot of crazy stuff out there. Yes. And, and, you know, maybe it's true, but it seemed really far out to me. There's still stuff that seems really far out there to me it's that like, I'm still, I'm like open to it now, but I'm like, I'm still, I'm still not quite on that train, <laughs> but I'm much more open than I would have been. Yeah. So I'm like, you know, so I really had to um, call out the things that resonated with me and make sense of them. And the things that I could not wrap my head around, I was like, eh, uh, okay, I think I'll park that. <laughs> so, um, because there's a lot of literature out there. So I just wanted a book that just had the concepts in it that resonated with me and people could feel were relatable to them instead of something so far out, you know? So that's, you know, that, but anyway, that's sort of some of the concept of what I, what I've learned. Another great thing I've learned is, um, you know, people think they're alone. They are never alone. <laughs> you know, the souls are here all the time wanting to help you. It's not like they're there resting in peace. Ask for help. You will get help if, if they can help you. And it's not that they're incapable of helping you, but they are not going to help you if it inhibits your soul's growth or your soul's purpose. So if your soul's purpose is to be stretched by not seeing any sign from the other side, they're not gonna send you a sign because they need your soul to stretch. It's more important that you get back there and they're like, I knew that was tough, but high five. 
instead of giving you everything you want. So the way I, um, I explain it is um, everybody has seen um, a child melt down for some reason or another. So the example I have is you have a three-year-old and he wants a candy bar for breakfast and he starts screaming and crying and you're his mother and you're not gonna give him a candy bar for breakfast. And he's so, I mean, he's just so distraught, you know, and he's crying and you look at him as an adult and you think to your, you feel badly, you know, he, feel, he feels horrible, that's such a shame. Um, but the candy bar means nothing because he's gonna have a million candy bars. Maybe I'll give him a candy bar after even, you know, lunch and he's gonna grow old and he's gonna get a job. He's gonna contribute to society. He's gonna fall in love. He may have his own kids fall out of love. He's gonna go through, this candy bar means nothing. Yet you see how he's looking, he's just so distraught. And that's how the other side looks at us. So we're screaming and crying for, for whatever it is. Well, I can't understand why I can't, and I, I'm not, not to minimize anything, but I can't yeah. pay rent or um, I can't understand why you left me, mom. Why did you die? Or why, you know, anything we're so, so, so distraught about, they're on the other side and they empathize. They feel badly that we feel this badly, but they understand it doesn't have the same meaning in mm -hmm. our life that we think it does the yeah. same way that three-year-old screaming over the candy bar it means everything to them but we know our perspective is different theory of relativity our perspective is broader and we know that candy bar doesn't mean anything their perspective they don't know everything on the other side but their perspective is even broader and they know that what we're screaming and grieving over doesn't mean what we think it does so that, you know, yes. that's a kind of example, you know. I love that example too. It's something that it's, it's something we can talk about you and I, and people that have that concept. And of course you have to be so delicate in saying it to somebody who is going through that period, of course. Right. However, it is, it is true that from what I understand from interviewing so many near death experiencers, this is just the snap of a finger. So yeah. people will say, why would I ever choose to come into this life and lose a child? Why would I ever come here and have cancer? And obviously you're not going to say, well, the answer is because you chose this, but uh, it's for your soul's growth. That's so inappropriate to say to somebody in grief, but it's the truth. I mean, for, for as I understand it, I don't, I don't want to say it's the truth, but it's what I know to be true. It's what I believe to be true of the other side. So, you know, that's the example of the child dying. I have that in my book also, because I, what I said is as an example, and I have this, this example in there when I speak about soul groups. Um, and I said, so we travel in soul groups of like 150 to 200 souls. And we are, we may not all be here at the same time, but here or there, we're sort of connected. And if you're in the soul group, you have levels even within the soul group. And let's say you have somebody that's pretty advanced and then you have some souls that are less advanced, but they're all within the same soul group. And the more advanced ones want to stretch the soul group. We want to move up in terms of our level of light, but maybe this one is like sort of, you know, dragging behind again, behind a bit. So what they may do is come up with a pact soul contract on the other side and they will say, I'll tell you what, we'll head back. You'll be my mother. I'll be your child. Yeah. I will die at five years old of leukemia. And you're going to have to live your whole earthly life with that. That's going to stretch your soul yeah. so that you can get closer so we can all move up. Yeah. So uh, uh, someone whose child died which is absolutely, I think, the, the worst, worst, yeah, the worst thing that a person can experience on Earth. The interesting dynamic is that that child's soul gave the parent's soul a gift. It's yeah. it's reversed. Yeah. They've given their parents the opportunity for their soul to stretch further than they ever could stretch on the other side or they ever could stretch if they had an easier life here. So they really gave their, their parent a gift. Now, no parent you know, would want that gift, but that's real. If you, th if you totally reverse why the universe is doing it, 
you can you would you can understand that it's a gift and this child on the other side is really looking forward to them coming back and it'd be like high five you 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 lived your life with that grief and 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 even worse than uh, dying which is bad enough what if they were murdered yeah i went to so many medium things when i was trying to figure it out and there was a there were repetitive themes when i would go there and there were many times many times where the medium was channeling two parents their child who was murdered and the murdered soul was saying to the parents you have to forgive whoever was who murdered me the neighbor in one case it was a neighbor you have to forgive them that's the way your soul is going to grow and i'm oh. thinking like how could you know yeah but that's what they're saying it's like if you can get through that huge it's huge it's, it's huge it's it's huge. so it's hot, so yeah. beyond what we can you know feel and think as humans but um but i heard that over and over again and i was like oh my god there's something to that it's not like it's one murdered soul i think i heard it probably four times in the four years that somebody was the parents are sitting there crying a medium is reading them the child is coming through saying you have to forgive my murderer and it's like really that's a stretching of the soul. Yeah, I, I read a woman the other day that lost her soulmate, her husband, who was the most beautiful human being. He was like an angel walking the earth. And I, he said to me, tell her this was meant to happen. I was like, I don't want to say that. I don't want to say that. So I, I, I kind of skirted around it, right? I was like, well, I don't know how to... So I kind of didn't say it, you know, I, and at the end of the reading, I said, do you have any questions? She said, I need to know if this was supposed to happen. Oh, see, that's so interesting. And I said, yeah, I heard it, but I didn't want to say it because I didn't yeah. want to minimize your grief. And I, if I'm wrong, I, you know, I don't want that responsibility of like causing an emotional wound, but I she's, I, I said, well, he told me this was like his soul contract and and she and and I said and he wanted me to say that to you, but I didn't want to hurt hurt you more. She said, "No, I've been asking that because I needed to know that for peace. Like I need so, so yeah. it's so he, yeah. He knew know, she could handle it. No, but he, I was she needed it. Yeah, yeah. I know. And it's horrible. But oh. that's I love I love um, hearing just hearing that it it it's." It doesn't make it easier when you're the one going through it. I know, I know. So easy to say. And then when it's you, you're just like, I, I can lose faith in a second. You know, if um, I'm always all, it's all meant to be and the universe knows what it's doing. But even I, as so, a human being, in five seconds can drop to the ground and say, oh, well, I guess so they don't. Beautiful. It is. But I'm. But it's a beautiful course, thing um, to know. Both my parents, two weeks apart from each other this April. Oh, and wow. They were enrolled in in-home hospice and my sister and I cared for them for the three months before they died. And there's a lot about their uh, deaths that I can look back knowing what I know and I know it was meant to be. And I know they're, they made it to the other side. I actually made a pact with my father that when he made it to heaven, he was gonna send me something specific and he did over and over again. I can tell you that it's really cool. But having yeah. said all that, the grief was horrible. It is oh. horrible. It is some kind of holidays now. Oh. oh my gosh. We're trying to find a new equilibrium for my family and everything. So even knowing everything I do, yeah. um, it was it, that, that feeling of grief is just, oh. it, it, like you said, it just drops you to the floor. Like, and you don't never know when it's going to hit. And it's, it's so like, it could be the littlest thing, you know, and yeah. then all of a sudden you just waterworks and, you know, but I think it would have been worse if I didn't know what I knew, you know? Yes. I think it, I think it would have been worse. But the grief That's, is we had that conversation because, you know, she said, this brought me so much comfort. And I said, I know it can't stop the pain. Yeah. That's not going to go away. I wish I could, so badly I could do something to take that away. But as you and I are discussing now, it's unfortunately, it's meant to be there. Yeah, it's right. brutal and it's cruel. It feels so cruel and unfair. And mm -hmm. I said, the one thing we all have in common is we're all going to lose somebody close to us. Yeah. 
you know, unless we're die when we're babies, but like yeah, at yeah. some point we're all going to go through that experience of grief. And that is actually something that brings us together. But even if there's that one sliver of hope and comfort, I know I said, I know it doesn't take away the feelings, right? but there is some comfort in knowing that it isn't the end that we are going to see these people again in the same form. Mm -hmm. It doesn't make it easier as we're here. I would love to hear about your father's message to you. After my father, right. Well, after yeah. my parents died, this is interesting. My, my sister said you had, this reminded me when you said everybody loses somebody. She said, I can't believe the whole world's walking around feeling this all the time. <laughs> like we wish, she, right. you know, I was like, I know it's like so many people. I, um, I dedicate my time to, um, an organization called the Forever Family Foundation. Mm -hmm. And the mission is to scientifically prove that there's an afterlife. And we do a lot of um, work. Actually, Teresa Caputo came from the Forever Family Foundation. She, yeah. she was certified there. And um, so we do a lot of work with mediums and scientists and, and, whatnot, and whatnot. And so I find that um, being around that on an ongoing basis, I already knew know that there's that everybody in the world's walking around with this grief it just yeah. comes and goes and comes and goes but my sister it you know she's like I just can't believe everybody's walking around like this all the time I said I, I, know. Know, I know I know but yeah when my dad um my father was 92 my mom was 90 90 when they both died and my mother was diagnosed with stage four lung cancer at the end of January she died the end of April so three months she was living in fine until then. We had the last year's holidays were fine. They were just like great, great holidays. Um, and then she started having problems walking and it turned out it was lung cancer spread to her spine. Um, my father had no life-threatening situation going, um, but he ended up dying first. You know, what we say of a broken heart because once he realized that she was going, he was not gonna hang around for that. Um, but having said that, my father, has had been, I'm going to say, wanting to be dead for probably four years prior. For, for four years, every day, he was done. You know what I mean? He was older. It was, he had rheumatoid arthritis. It was hard to get around. He said, like, why is God keeping me here? I can't go out like I used to. He had macular degeneration. He was going blind. Why? I can't see like I used to. He was De slowly deteriorating and really not comfortable being here. So every day for, for four or five years, it's like, you think I'm going to die today, Annette? You think to, and I would say, oh, I don't know, Dad, you, look, you look pretty good. I don't think today's the day. Um, but when um, he, after he realized my mother was not going to be getting better, um, he basically stopped eating, stopped walking, became incontinent, basically overnight. Like March 26th, he was walking. March 27th, he was not. Um, so we had, we were had, my mother was being enrolled in in-home hospice and my father had stopped walking out of nowhere. So we said, we can take him to a hospital and check him in and then 92 years old and he wants to be gone they'll probably be doing tests on him and then she's home dying of cancer like do we separate them like we didn't even know what to do but we had the doctor coming to check her in for in-home hospice so we said you know what let them check well they it's like a house calls <laughs> they're checking yeah. her let them check him you know? yeah. so they came to enroll my mom and they checked him and they told my sister and I um, they pulled us aside after checking him and said, he's further along in the dying process than she is. And we were like, what? Because he was walking yesterday. And she's he in hospice. He's, yeah. and she's got lung cancer and he doesn't have anything. So whatever. Um, so we had them both enrolled March 29th, Tuesday, March 29th, both enrolled in in-home hospice. We cleared out their furniture in a minute and a half. We got two hospital beds in there and my sister and I, we hired an aide and whatever. Um, but since my father was very open to talking about dying, since he had talked about dying for four years prior, my mother was not open to talking about dying because she did not want to die. She had a lot more living to do. Um, since, But since he would talk about it, now as he was getting, he was in a hospice bed and he, was, uh, he said, Annette, do you think I'm going to die today? I would say, you know something, dad, I don't know. I don't know, you know, it, it's, it looks like it might, maybe not today, but it's gonna be soon. So um, 
now I could see he was getting anxious. You know, he went for four yeah. or five years, like, I'm going to die. And now all of a sudden he really couldn't move. He was in a bed. He, he was really going to be dying. And so um, he was still talking about death. So I said, all right, dad, when you get to heaven, I need a white swan. That's what I want. I want a white swan. I want you to show me a white swan. He, he and his brother owned a dry cleaner in the town we grew up in. And it was a white swan dry cleaners. He sold it in 1985. He sold it in 1985. Um, my uncle died in, in 2000. Um, but a white swan meant something to us. So, and the, the people he bought it from kept the name actually, but whatever. So I, I said, I want to see a white swan. So he was like, oh, he was getting, you know, just tired and sick. He was like, I'll try, I'll try. I was like, and he goes, you think I'll be able to do it? I'm like, I know you will. You're going to go to the other side. You're going to, you're going to still be here. You're going to see me. I'm not going to see you. I was telling him everything I had learned. And he, he knew from years, I mean, they knew I wrote my book. So they knew I was, and I was like, but you're going to be able to get me a white swan. When you get to heaven, I need to know you. And he was like, I'll try. I'll try. So for five days, I kept asking for this white swan. And then, um, and it, I didn't know it was going to be five days, but April 12th, he died. April 12th was the worst day that I can remember in my, in my life because the funeral home came in to take my father while my mother is in a hospice bed dying of, you know, uh, cancer. Uh, she ended up dying two weeks later. My sister and I go to the funeral home. We plan two funerals, two caskets, two outfits to the dry cleaner to, you know, just, just, it was two mass cards. It was horrible. We get home that night. It's like nine o'clock at night, crying, 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 horrible. Um, we, I open my iPad just to veg out. I'm at their, their kitchen table. It's at, um, we're at their house. I was living in their house for three months. And um, I turn on Facebook because I just want to just see what, you know, mindless thing I can look at. And so yeah. I turn on Facebook and the first thing that pops up is um, a, a fellow, a person who's in a closed book, a closed Facebook group in the town I live in. And he, and he says, I just moved here. Can anybody recommend a dry cleaner? And then I see the answers, white swan, white swan, white swan, That's one day. White swan. And I'm like, <gasps> I think my dad made it to heaven. Oh my God. <laughs> so weird. So it gets better. So I, um, so I then posted on my Facebook that I'm, I'm very moved because I think my father made it to heaven. And I'd say the white swan story. I also said, you know, he had every box checked. He had, he was 92. He lived until he died. I mean, he, they lived until they died. The two of them, they died very quickly neither of them was a widow in the traditional sense of the word because you know they both went so quickly to each other yeah. neither of them really had to care for the other one while they were dying or anything like that because we were there caring for them he wanted to for the last four years he was like done with life you know um he they celebrated their 67th anniversary a month earlier they were going to get going to go to the other side together he had every box check and now the final box which is send me something when you get to heaven and he sent me a white swan like he made it to heaven so I post this in my thing so um the next day I get a mess an instant message like first thing in the morning there's a woman who I've never met in person she read my book she's from Canada and her son had died in 2019 and she wrote and published a book this year, 2022, um, and she asked 35 people to donate a chapter about the afterlife to this book. And she, so I was one of the people that donated a chapter to the book. So I'm chapter six, the book is called Gatherings at the Doorway, great book. And there are people from all over the world. And so I'm, I'm chapter six. Okay, so now I've never met her, you know, I'm just a person, but I contributed to, she reaches out to me an instant message and she said, I, like she said, I'm, I'm, I'm like in disbelief. I just read your Facebook post and I look out my cottage and there's a single swan on a lake out there. I've never seen the swan. I've lived here for you know eight years. I've never seen a swan on this lake. And, uh, and I said, oh my gosh, I think my dad is endorsing our book. Like the, yeah. the book I think he's 
like Annette and Camille, her name is, you're on to something. <laughs> so I was like, that is so cool. She's since told me, this was April 12th. So um, I was a guest author on a book club, um, an, an international book club, and she was um, hosting it. And she said, I just want you to still know, I never saw the swan after that day either. So she saw wow. this April 12th, never before, never after. And later that day, she saw two swans. And, and so I know he met up with my uncle, you know, uh, yes. one, you know, and they were soulmates for sure. So I was like, my uncle's in my book because he was a big part of uh, helping me understand the afterlife once I was getting my eyes open. But anyway, um, so I was like, I can't believe that. So now he's endorsing the book. So the next day I tell his neighbor, I'm living in his house, caring for my mother. I tell his neighbor, who's my age, and I said about the, he said, I'm so sorry about your father. I tell him, yeah, I know. And I tell him about the swan. And then the next day, so I think like maybe he died on a, on a Tuesday. So this was now Friday morning. Um, Joe, the next door neighbor, sends me a picture of a swan. He goes, Annette, this is so weird. A friend of ours is out walking in Massapequa town near us and he finds a swan on the lake and he just sends it to this group of guys and he doesn't even know the story. And I said, that's sort of weird, like a, a guy sending a picture yeah. of a swan. Yeah. So Joe, my next door neighbor said, I just made me think of your dad. And I was like, wow, that's so cool. I think my dad's acknowledging that I told you the story. Um, and then the icing on the cake was that later that night, like 7, 7.15, the next door neighbor texts me and he goes, Annette, your dad's cracking me up. Turn on Wheel of Fortune. The clue was living thing and the answer was white swan. I know. Ah, I love it. I don't, I, and you know, that's the thing is that our loved ones <laughs> in spirit, they can, you know, you're like, People will say, oh, you know, I see that bird. That's my grandma. Well, it's not like the bird is your grandma. The bird, your grandmother is drawing attention to that bird, motivating it to fly. There's a whole thing that goes on, which is, yeah. I don't, but they motivating people. I think I'm going to send a picture of that swan. Like that's not his thought. That was, and, and I think that's something that people also um, need to know is that sometimes you think it's your own thought. It's actually prompted by spirit, inspiration, music. Yeah. Yes. Um, the way the design computers, I, it, I feel that it's all yes spiritually inspired. Yes. They're working on the other side. I mean, these brilliantly famous people who are here, the wonderful scientists, wonderful m musicians, they don't just go to the other side and then not do what their, their life's work was here. Right. They're still doing this on the other side and they're planting inspirational seeds in us as the, as needed or as you know, appropriate. Um, I have a friend that um, uh, has, who also had a son that died years and years ago. And he said when his son first died, he was, um, his son came to an, in, in, him in a dream. And uh, his son had a, a, a tray with gold apples on it. And his son was like drifting backwards and he was following his son. And every once in a while, the, 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 um, tray would chip and an apple would fall off and the father being protective of the son would be like, well, you know, straighten the tray out. But as um, the son looked down and the father looked down in his dream and he saw the earth, like the, just looked like the earth. And um, he would go back again and drop another apple. And at, one, at some point there were no more apples on the thing and his father looked at him and he said to his father, these are pieces of knowledge and he's dropping them to the earth. So when they need to, they yeah. drop pieces of knowledge. That's the way my mother-in-law did it for me. She dropped pieces of knowledge so that I would, you know, understand what was going on and share it. So um, that's so beautiful. Yeah. Well, know. with all, I mean, I right. know we could we could just there's so many things we could continue to talk about. And in the interest of brevity, I'm just gonna wrap it up by asking you brevity that's funny not brevity but <laughs> appropriate length uh okay. I know you've said a lot but what is one thing you what is the most important thing that you want people to know so uh you're right there are a lot of important things but I what I like what I would like to say as the final thought yeah. is um if people were able to live their life dropping the feeling associated with the word compare mm. 
they would live so much more of a, of a purposeful life. And people think of com the word compare, like, well, I don't compare myself to others, but when you're comparing yourself to yourself, comparing yourself to what you used to be, comparing yourself to what you thought you would be at this point in your life, comparing yourself to what you had yesterday, comparing yourself to what you want to be that you're not, it's still compare. And it, it holds no place in, in you living your purpose, none. It's only, a, a, you know, it makes things more difficult for you. So if people could just, I know that sometimes comparisons motivate people, but more often than not, they're detrimental. And so I feel like if people could just drop the feeling associated with the word compare and try and live their authentic life, the life that they are meant to live for themselves, we'd all be better off. So I'll end with that. Amen. I love that so much. Really appreciate it. And, I, and I've and i gotten so, about, so much out of hearing your, oh, I hear these amazing insights every week, but mm -hmm. I've gotten so much out of hearing yours and I'm really grateful that you've taken time to be here and share these insights with me, with my guests and for just being you. You're just a beautiful person and I'm so grateful to have you here. Thank you. Right back at you. Thank you. Thank, thank you. <laughs>